While the safe return of the Kerbinauts from the Dres mission was considered a successful failure, the Kerbal public was beginning to lose faith in the KSC's ability. Many thought they had been too brash, too bold, too heavy-handed in the way they conducted their missions. Some even said Kassa had outright failed in their exploration of the inner Kerbal system. In order to quell a potential public uproar, the KSC simply had to make sure that a crewed mission to the outer Kerbal system worked flawlessly. And, with funds running short due to recent failures, it had to be low cost as well. The solution? To build two reusable space planes, one for cargo and one for crew, in order to construct a station in low Kerbin orbit to test new technologies for the long duration mission to Jewel. Though many simulations were run during the build stage, the first mission for both of these planes was their first time in free flight due to the ever tightening budget cuts laid upon CASA. Nevertheless, on a surprisingly cloudless day at the KSC, a gleaming Dynawing shuttle named Prosperity stood on a pad, ready for its first trip to the heavens above. So, after a week's hiatus from actually uploading YouTube videos due to absolutely getting hammered with college work, I am officially back and bringing you somewhat of a, a story-based series. Uh, guys, welcome to my first video in 1.0.5. Now, as I said, I have been very, very busy the past week. That is why I, am, I have not built these crafts myself. Uh, these are some of the stock shuttles that came with 1.0.5. Like I say, this is the Dyna Wing that I'm flying, flying first. This is sort of the cargo shuttle that I mentioned in the intro clip. Uh, this is carrying a module which I have designed, which is the first module of the space station, which is still got a name, which is going to be confirmed soon. Um, although I have got a sort of plan for this series. Um, but I'd never flown shuttles before in KSP because, well, shuttles are hard, or always used to be hard in Kerbal Space program and uh, with the introduction of these new vectoring engines that have like a, a seriously incredible gimbal like they, I think it's something like 30 degrees I might be wrong there so don't quote me on that but it is a very very large gimbal range that they have they can carry huge payloads um, very very easily indeed so I thought I might as well give it a try and uh, see what's what with this new shuttle um, unfortunately, as usual, this is one of my missions, uh, so we know that nothing is going to go to plan. And you will see here that the lack of testing and actual physical testing rather than just running simulations uh, is going to hurt us quite substantially on both of the missions I'm going to be showing you on this mission, on this, uh, on this episode type thing, should I say. But you can see here we've got into orbit with the Dynawing. We are releasing the space station module uh, using the RCS here. We're just writing it now putting the solar panels out this of course as i said in the intro is going to test long duration technologies and ideas ahead of our mission to jewel at least that's the plan anyway you'll see later why that may not be the case you can see here we're also getting some footage of the external tank here um falling away which is obviously still very very close to us which wouldn't happen in real life in real life the external tank would just fall back to earth um, and it would burn up in the atmosphere with the real space shuttle, but this is Kerbal Space Program and I needed that fuel, so we released it once we were in orbit. But we are taking a look around the space station now, taking a little EVA, using that lovely new EVA nav ball, which really, really is helping with regards to orientation and stuff. Although it is kind of annoying that it follows the camera, I'd have thought it maybe followed the Kerbal instead, but hey-ho, uh, there's not much we can do about that. It's still very, very nice to have at least some form of reference point while on EVA. And of course, we're doing a fly, a fly around of the underside of the shuttle in order to check that there has been no damage on launch, um, no damage to the under under uh, side heating tiles that may perhaps make us burn up on re-entry. Um, of course, because we don't want that to happen, these are very very low cost missions. These are well, they're very high cost initially, but. In the long term, these things will save us money. These uh, very, very expensive shuttles will save the space program money, meaning more money can be invested in this big grand adventure out to Jewel. 
Or at least, like I say, that was the plan. Unfortunately, things will start to go wrong very, very quickly. So, we're about to deorbit here. The first mission has been a success. We're using the monopropellant engines here. We are trying to land in that desert area here because, well, the KSC was just a little bit uh, too far on this occasion. But we are su successfully deorbit. We're successfully uh, now aligning ourselves, de de-deploying, if that's even a word, the solar panels ready to, uh, to re-enter Kerbin's atmosphere. Now, unfortunately, this is where things start to go wrong. We close the cargo bay and we keep the reaction control system on because things may start to get a little hairy. We don't, this, like I say, this is pretty much untested as we go through into the atmosphere here. You can see the heat starting to rise. Now, this was more down to piloting error more than anything rather than actual build quality, which is why we are going to be keeping the Dynawing Prosperity in, uh, in actual active service for future episodes to come. Um, this was pilot error more than anything. Unfortunately, an error occurred. Re-entry happened fine. You can see here, re-entry, we're, uh, we're getting a fair amount of heating and the cockpit is starting to show a few signs of overheating here and there. But for the most part, it's all okay and all fine and dandy and everything went pretty according to plan, to be fair. Slowing down, getting some lovely views from the cockpit here of uh, the crew filming their, uh, their epic return to Earth after a whole, what, 30 minutes, maybe an hour in orbit here? Um, you can see here we still have plenty of monopropellant in the uh, in the engine should we need to go a little bit further of a distance to get to a flat landing site. Um, you can see the flames are actually licking around quite bright now. You can see uh, we're starting to get a little bit of an overheat on those uh, on those gimballing engines at the back there. So we're just trying to manage that just a little bit. Just try and pitch the nose up trying to get them a little bit more occluded from the flames. But you can see here we're starting to slow down now. We're starting to lose a few of those flame effects as we start to get lower. Turn to Mac effects. I try to pull up and the shuttle disintegrates. On hindsight, I realise that that could have been solved with just struts and everything. But you can see I'm furiously trying to uh, get this thing to slow down. But unfortunately, this is not to be and we lose the crew. Yeah. Thankfully, I know the issue for that, so that will be sorted. This is where the trouble started to come in, though. This, I didn't even name this crew shuttle. This is one of the stock shuttles, another one of the stock shuttles, which is for crew only. You can see it makes use of the new Mark I command pod and uh, the two Mark the two Mark I sort of crew cabin things that are meant for sort of private jet type uh, aircraft here. You can see it's pretty damn fast. It gets into orbit pretty well, I'm not going to lie. Um, unfortunately, I think I took somewhat of a steep trajectory on this launch, and the engines are sort of inefficient. They're those the new re the uh, new re radial redesigned sort of engines that we used to have. Remember the re the radial like the white engines? They've sort of been redesigned for 1.1 1.05, should I say, to sort of make them look more like a um, the shuttles sort of monopropellant engines it used to use. Um, unfortunately, they're still not very efficient, and as you can see, we've burnt through most of our actual liquid fuel here in the main in the main tank stage, and we are having to resort to using monopropellant as well. Now, what this mission's doing is actually sending up the first crew to this space station that we are sending uh, to accommodate, um, to help construct, etc., etc., future modules when they so arrive. Unfortunately. I didn't have enough um, RCS to complete some of the maneuvers or the slowdown procedure um, to actually get in with the th with the, the space station. However, I did check and this thing did have enough delta V. I did ditch the external tank perhaps a little bit early when it still had a little bit of fuel left in it. And so as a result, I kind of cheated. I feel bad for cheating, but I did resort to the debug menu to give me infinite RCS just to get me in. and. I think I roughly had enough delta V um, in the craft regardless, it's just I wasted that so many meters per second, but I'm just playing up and saying it to you now, you'll see me put the debug, dig mum, the demug, the debug menu up in a couple of minutes, um, just, just to turn on infinite RCS, just to get the final approach in, because I was, I was an absolute idiot there guys, and I'm sorry for cheating, because I don't usually cheat on Kerbal Space Program, but I was tired. I, I had limited time to actually do this video, but um, this mission, I, I certainly got my just desserts, shall we say. Also, on a separate note, I do like the new Mark 1 cockpit, um, although it is kind of pointless. 
Um, you can see there in a couple of shot a couple of frames ago, you could see that um, there was an actual docking mode in the front in the front uh, cabin of the Mark One cockpit. There is a screen that says docking mode, and if you double click it, it makes you go to the back of the cabin, and you can look through the little docking window at the back, and you have a whole new set of controls and stuff. Um, I think it's purely an aesthetic thing, or just if you want to do stuff in IVA, you can now, and you can sort of like dock in IVA and what have you. Um, but personally, I think it's pretty cool, but it's pretty useless for a reason you'll see a bit later on, because the Mark 1 cockpit doesn't like being, well, it's not so much being in space, it's more coming back from space that it doesn't like. Like I say, most of the Mark 1 plane parts are meant for atmospheric planes now. Um, they're mostly for, uh, sky sort of like planes that aren't designed to go out of the atmosphere basically they don't respond well to um heating and what have you and stuff like that but you can see here with coming around with the rendezvous here i probably should have cut most of this out but i thought you might as well see the whole process seen as i i did cheat shall i say we're still on legit fuel at the moment but it was around about this sort of time i was starting to get confused and uh, rather worried, should I say, about um, how much fuel I had left. Well, we have a beautiful sunrise there. And you can see I'm opening the clamp the inline clampertron we have there. As we are come up to our closest approach, and it's here that I realise we won't have enough fuel to actually rendezvous properly anyway with the station. And, and come home. But I wasn't really worried about coming home. It was more just getting there in the first place, really. Um, like I say, I did end up using Infinite RCS to actually get us home as well. And like I say, I never cheat in this game, and it felt bad. I really felt bad for cheating, and I will try not to do it again in future episodes. It's just that I wanted to get this mission done for you guys because I have awesome plans for this little saga if I actually have time to actually make it and stuff like that. But you can see here we're coming up on closest approach now, sort of. We're trying to awkwardly align ourselves. Like I say, this is what happens when you rush missions in Kerbal Space Program like I do so, so often. Um, you just end up, everything goes wrong. <laughs> everything that could go wrong does go wrong, basically. You can see there's the debug menu there and me turning on Infinite RCS. Like I say, not my proudest moment in Kerbal Space Program, but um, they, there you go. I won't, I won't bang on about it anymore. Basically, the point of this mission, you can see we have the crew in the uh, in the bottom right hand corner. There is uh, those crew are going to be there for when the space station um, is the modules are arriving for the space station. They're going to be there to help go on EVA and attach the modules and stuff like that. Basically, similar to how the ISS was built in real life. Um, except that this is obviously Kerbal Space Program, and this is testing for a much, much longer gen uh, duration mission than a mission to Mars. We are talking a uh, possibly permanent stay within Julian's system, potentially on lathe. Now, what we're looking to do is eventually colonize the Julian system, so we want to have regular ships going back and forth. Now, what I propose is having a ship similar to the Hermes in the movie The Martian, and the book The Martian for that matter. Um, I propose having a ship that remains harboured in low Kerbin orbit. We send a crew, we send a new lander and stuff like that up each time, and uh, each one will have a different mission. Each Hermes mission, or whatever I end up calling the mothership, will have a different mission to Jewel, and um, it will have a different purpose, different moon, etc. Or it may do it in one whole mission. I'm not too sure yet. It all depends on the success of these uh, of these space plane missions. And speaking of success, we are about to dock with the station here. Once I've done a little bit of faffing around because I hate having docking ports that aren't aligned properly like this one. It's no, no fault of um, the actual thing itself. It's just where it's positioned on the craft. It's not very ergonomic. Um, I don't know how I managed to dock like space shuttles and the like before when I've had... Um, like inline clampertrons within the cargo bay and stuff but you can see that the passengers in the in the plane here do have somewhat of a a lovely view out onto Kerbin perhaps even means we could do space tourism at some point although I don't want to get into that too much because that's going to be a whole other endeavor that I don't want to get into or promise anything for but we've delivered the crew now so we're going to undock and begin deorbiting this is where things start to go wrong yet again, because unfortunately this plane, as I said earlier, it doesn't like re-entry heating or whatever you want to call it, the hypersonic plasma or whatever you like to call the flames licking around it. It basically doesn't like getting very hot 
And um, the inline cockpit at the front, um, the new one, or even the Mark 1 one before it, it doesn't like, it's meant for atmospheric planes, like I say. And so what we're trying to do here, I think, is we're trying to land it back roughly at the KSC. So we're waiting till the KSC is in the daylight so that we have uh, a view. And you can see here that we're now burning retrograde to try and bring our periapsis down to make sure that um, we do actually land somewhat on course. And you can see me here now taking off the Infinite RCS so I can at least do this landing somewhat legit. And of course, turning to face prograde because if we flip retrograde, it wouldn't be a very good time at all. But as, you can, as we come down here, you'll begin to see what I mean. Uh, this is our last few photos taken from orbit before transmission went dead with, with this craft. Unsurprisingly, I don't think we're going to be continuing this line of shuttle. The Prosperity, we will be. The Prosperity can carry both crew and cargo. So we will be continuing uh, with the crew cargo program. Unfortunately, this won't be part of it. You can see here it starts to get quite hot right from the get-go. Um, I'm not too sure what happens. I don't know why this is a space plane to begin with. You can see the cockpit heating up very, very quickly here. And quickly followed by other sections of the plane itself here. You can see it's starting to, uh, starting to overheat quite quickly. I don't know if this is meant for low altitudes or what have you. But you can see here the cockpit did actually explode, explode killing Jebediah. And leaving Valentina to basically ride it down. Valentina survived the initial explosion. And uh, she does indeed survive re-entry, just about, um, even though she has no control authority over this plane because she sat in the uh, in the crew compartments here, which incidentally, when I tried to do an emergency evacuation maneuver, I found out they have no hatch, or at least not to my knowledge anyway. If they do on this plane, then it is obstructed because unfortunately Valentina could not get out of this thing alive. So it looks like we're not going to be continuing with this, but it's another loss of like seven crew which is not good on Cass's records. Guys, my name is Bradders. I hopefully will continue with this program, and as always, peace out.